welcome everybody who's watching or watching later. Um, this is uh, session two of uh, Headless WordPress development. And um, I'm here with uh, Jeff Everhart and Tom Woodward, who are going to help us expand on the stuff we learned last time um, about, you know, what what you can do with Headless WordPress. And this time we're going to dig a little bit more into specifics, look at some examples, do so, get some data out of uh, API uh, REST APIs, and we'll talk about GraphQL. So I'm pretty excited to see all of that stuff. And um, but I'll, I'll uh, kick it right off to uh, um, uh, Jeff and Tom. I guess why, why don't you, Jeff? You can reintroduce yourself, and Tom, you can introduce yourself, just in case someone's tuning in for session two. Yeah, sure. Rock on. So my my name is Jeff Everhart. I'm a developer advocate with uh, WP Engine, and I focus on uh, advocating for and educating developers on headless WordPress technology, some of which WP Engine is, you know, developing as open source projects or products that, that we market. Uh, but then really, I'm just here to support the community and to sort of build this style of development uh, through advocacy work like this. Um, and I'm pumped to be here. So Taylor, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be uh, back in the saddle with my good buddy, Tom. So I'll kick it over to him. All right. So I'm uh, Tom Woodward and Jeff and I used to work together in the good old days of VCU. Yeah. Uh, I now work at Middlebury College and have been kind of wandering around in WordPress land for, I don't know, good 15, 20 years now, I guess, <laughs> which is terrifying to say. So, yeah. Yeah. And I'll say as kind of like an aside, you know, when, when did the REST API come out, Tom? Like 2016, really at the start of when we started working together at VCU. So, you know, back when headless WordPress was even more in its infancy than it is now, like we, we were always messing around with this style of development um, and sort of just seeing what we could apply this API driven uh, style of development to in terms of the products that we could create and the tools that we could create for people. And it's, so it's really flexible. Um, and I figured I'd kick us off by just like, sort of resetting the stage based on where we left things uh, on Tuesday. Uh, and so I'll just sort of reiterate this because I know we might have some folks who are watching this stream and haven't watched the other one. Um, but I always like to answer this question because this is something I get a lot from people who are new to Headless WordPress, like just what is Headless WordPress? And maybe they've heard it in the context of a specific set of technologies. And so one of the things that I like to talk about is that Headless WordPress is an architectural pattern and not a set of specific technologies, right? And so I often talk about headless WordPress in the context of building a house, right? We have raw materials, we've got mortar, we've got bricks, or we've got wood, we've got concrete, we've got cement siding, you know, we have vinyl siding, we have all these different materials that we can then take and assemble into blueprints or patterns that we can then reuse to build this these houses. And in this case, we're talking about digital real estate. And right, those span uh, a variety of different aesthetics, a uh, variety of different functional purposes, right? And so I, I don't want you to feel that headless WordPress means using any one of these things to build a site. Really what it means is using WordPress's API capabilities, whether that's REST or GraphQL, to build some of those different experiences. And so we can have our Spanish style stucco, you know, Mediterranean tile villas, and then we can also have our you know, log cabins that look like they're up in the Swiss mountains or something, right? So there's enough room in, in this area of development to sort of satisfy all those purposes. Um, but what we'll do now is like, just sort of take a look at this architectural diagram. And I've only got really two of these for you today. If you're with us on Tuesday, you've already seen this one. Uh, but this just describes what uh, the, the interaction uh, between traditional WordPress looks like for the visitor, the developer, and the person who's publishing the content. Um, and I think that this is important to, to sort of talk about, especially when we compare that to what headless WordPress looks like. So over on the right-hand side, we have this visitor, right? And when they type site.com slash page into a URL bar, you know, maybe they're, oh, sorry, maybe they're interacting with a CDN, but ultimately that request gets forward, forwarded on to your WordPress server, right? That stack of PHP files that's living on your LAMP stack. And it's WordPress's job to take that URL and to say, okay, are they looking for a post or a page? Which template do I need to render? And then it goes to your database, gets all the data, 
and renders that up as HTML and ships it back to the user, right? So that's the interaction that the visitor experiences with WordPress. As a developer, we have a similar experience, right? We're, we're interacting, interacting mainly with WordPress core. We're creating themes and plugins and PHP and uploading those to the server. And our, most of our interaction with WordPress is mediated through, through those means. Same with the publisher, right? When they go to publish content in the CMS, they log into WP admin and uh, you know maybe you've got custom post types or meta fields out there that you've structured out so that things look a particular way. But ultimately that's what that experience looks like for the publisher, right? They're all interacting with this WordPress core environment. Now headless WordPress uh, flips that on its head just a little bit. And so when I show a lot of people this diagram, like I, I sometimes see like eyes bug out because it is by nature just a little bit more complex. And then the other thing that I'll also mention is that, you know, us at WP Engine, obviously like we're, we're investing a lot of time, energy and resources into open source headless tools. But at the same time, we're also, you know, selling hosting products, right? And those are geared toward a specific audience, a specific subset of people. So a lot of what you'll see today is geared towards the, those types of people, like the, your, your web agencies out there who are developing, you know, sites for large enterprises or, or businesses, you know, so here we'll start with this same visitor journey, right? And maybe they're interacting with a CDN ahead of it, but what, when they make this request for site.com slash page, uh, a lot of the times that, that doesn't necessarily go directly to WordPress, right? And I'm calling this a client here just because this is a really flexible space in this architectural diagram. And so this can be a lot of different things. This could be in this example, a Node.js runtime. So I talked a lot about full stack JavaScript frameworks like Next, uh, Nuxt, SvelteKit, things like that, that are a JavaScript based application that's going to intercept this call. Um, they could also be as simple as an HTML page running on a separate server, right? So they're requesting this HTML page or an iOS or Android application, right? So this, this space right here could really be any number of different things. It could be as simple as an HTML page, it could be a total, totally separate mobile application or Internet of Things device. But what happens here is when we make a request uh, of this application, it then looks at the looks at the particular URL, says, all right, what is it that they're trying to get? And then it makes a request back to WordPress core using its API. And so basically it's saying, you know, go out to your API, get me all of the data for the post with the ID of 137. WordPress responds to that, returns some data back to us. And then once it gets back to this application, we get to make some determinations about how that HTML or presentation ultimately gets sent back to the user. Okay, so I know this is a little bit more complicated, uh, but bear with me for just a second, because there are some good reasons why we might want to do this. So as the publisher, the publisher still gets to interact with WP Admin just the way that they normally would. But it gives us as the developer a lot of flexibility in how we want to build this sort of intermediary step. Right? If we're building an iOS or Android application that requests data from the WordPress API, we're going to use a specific set of tools to do that. If I'm building a full stack JavaScript framework driven website, like a Next.js website, which is sort of built around React, you know, I'm using a specific set of tools to do that. And so there are all, a bunch of other different ways that we sort of talked about in our last section on this sort of spectrum of complexity, right? So we've got those things over here, those standalone clients, like an iOS or Android application on the right, you know, we've got Next.js and things like that that require their own server to run. And that's part of what our Atlas hosting platform solves, right? Is if you want to use a separate server to run the front end of your website and really just use WordPress as a CMS, you know, we've got tools that enable you to do that without overloading your infrastructure or, or your people, right? But I've also said that this could be as simple as an HTML page. And in a lot of cases, what these front end frameworks, something like Gatsby, for example, enables you to do is it enables you to sort of get the best of both worlds. Like I, I get to write JavaScript components, design my pages in this front end framework, and then it will statically generate all those HTML files so that there's really not a huge difference uh, between that and just a basic HTML file when you load it up in your browser. Um, so, and this again, just gives us as a developer a lot of flexibility in determining how we wanna solve this particular problem and what we want this sort of intermediary application to be. And then WordPress's responsibility is really relegated to, you know, 
creating that publisher interface so that people can input data into the CMS and then returning that data to a variety of applications uh, via the API. Um, so I've said that word a lot. And again, I just wanna go, you know, really, really as low level as we can, or maybe as high level and, and talk about what these terms mean, just because I'm not sure where everybody's coming at uh, from the skill wise. So what's an API? API stands for Application Programming Interface. And you'll hear this word tossed around a lot. And all that really means is that it's like a set of rules or conventions that allows two systems, so maybe you have WordPress in this application, or sometimes a system in a human to communicate and exchange data. And I, I emphasize rules and conventions there because I think that's ultimately what's important. You know, no two APIs are the same. Some of them have the same conventions, some of them follow the same patterns and same rules, but there's gonna be slight differences between them. Um, and so most modern APIs use something called JSON data, uh, to, to transmit and interact in that way. And so what JSON data looks like, if you've done any work with JavaScript, it looks very much like a JavaScript object literal, right? We have these curly braces and inside of these curly braces, we have what are called key value pairs. So on the left-hand side of this colon, we have a key, which basically says what it is. And then on the right-hand side of that, we have the value. So here you can see, we've got this object with uh, that maybe represents me as a user. And over on the left-hand side, we've got this first name property or key and the value of that's Jeff, last name, Everhart. But to complicate this just a little bit, JSON in itself can be nested and contain other objects, right? So here we see this example where we've got a really simple key value pair. We've got first name on the left-hand side and then Jeff on the right-hand side. But for my contact information, maybe I have multiple different contact methods listed in this service or this program. And so I've got contact here, which then opens up another object that has its own key value pairs. So my Twitter handle is this and my website is that. Um, and so if you don't have a ton of experience working with JSON, um, one of the things that I'll recommend that you install, look up JSON formatter, J-S-O-N formatter. Uh, it's a Google Chrome extension and it'll be really helpful here in just a couple of steps once we bust out of of this presentation mode and start looking at some of these actual APIs. Um, so what I wanna talk about today uh, in this first part of the session are a couple of different uh, popular WordPress API options. I'm gonna give you sort of an overview of each right now. And then what we'll do is we'll bust out of this slideshow and I'll pull up some tools in Google Chrome and we'll walk through uh, a couple of these different things. So I'm gonna start with the REST API. Because I think that's important because the REST API ultimately is what's built into WordPress core, right? So when I talk about the REST API, this is a core part of WordPress. If you've used the block editor, um, the block editor interaction is pretty much entirely built around the REST API. So once you load that block editor, everything is really just a, a single page JavaScript application manipulating data and then sending data to and from this REST API to save your changes to get additional data back to populate blocks. So if you're looking for like an example of that, you know, it, it's in there, it's not going anywhere. But REST architecture, which stands for representational state transfer, that's the last time I'll use that word because it's not super important, but it focuses on creating an endpoint for each resource, right? So we have a URL to get our posts, a URL to get our categories, our authors, our pages, all those things are separate collections of resources. And so with REST, that's great. Everything's really separate and nice, but sometimes as application developers, that means we might need to make multiple round trips to get all the data we need. Okay, so if we're looking for posts and pages to construct an HTML page for one particular view, like say I've got a post data up here and then I've got some related pages down below, those might necessitate two separate calls to the API. So that's one issue with REST. The other issue being that sometimes we get back more data that we need than we need which is called overfetching. So when I hit uh, an endpoint to get data from a particular post, uh, I don't really get to choose what that data looks like or how it's structured. A lot of times I just have to accept whatever the API is gonna give back to me. Now, there are a couple of caveats to this with WordPress. There, there are two things, oh, I'm sorry, that we'll look at here in just a second called you know, the, the embed and fields that'll, that'll address some of that. Um, but those are just some of the core, I guess, developer gripes around REST architecture and part of what GraphQL uh, likes to solve. 
So over on the other hand, other side of this slide, we've got GraphQL, okay? And so GraphQL exists as its own thing, uh, sort of separate from WordPress, right? Um, GraphQL was a technology that was invented by Facebook, and it's essentially a declarative query language uh, that turns the Word WordPress database into a graph via a plugin uh, called WP GraphQL. Um, so there's typically one GraphQL endpoint that accepts these formatted queries and that returns data from across that graph. So the benefit of this is that we can get data from multiple collections uh, in the format we specify all in one request, right? So I can say, get me the post data with the post ID of 29 and all of the pages written by the author with the ID of nine. And I can send that all off as one request and I get back just one response. Um, and so I think the barrier here is added complexity, right? This isn't a core piece of WordPress technology. Uh, even though I think Matt Mullenweg has like privately admitted that if he had to do this again, they might have done GraphQL as the API mechanism for, for WordPress instead of REST. Instead of REST. Um, but so we've got to learn, we've got an install, installed an additional plugin. There are some barriers to learning, obviously, GraphQL. Um, I'll show you some tools that are built into this WP GraphQL plugin that make uh, composing those queries really easy to do. But then also in sometimes, you know, depending on how we're building our application, you might need to install additional packages to sort of help you manage that. Um, but both really cool tools uh, and that I think we should go take a look at. And so I'm going to hop out here and I'm just going to check in. Tom, uh, I know that was a decent, decently long spiel. Is there anything you think I should go back over or anything you want to emphasize? Well, I have a question. Where we hop in. Yeah, there we just go. Just out of oddness's sake, right? When we talk about headless, you you emphasize like it's not so much about technologies, it's more like a I, I don't know, an orientation. Mm -hmm. So would it be fair to say it's really just using part of WordPress for one thing and then being able to access and do whatever with the data in another way, shape, or form? Yes. I think really the architectural pattern centers around this interaction. Like this diagram, again, is sort of based on the hosting platform the WP Engine offers, which is geared towards a specific set of technologies, right? Basically using JavaScript frameworks to create this Node.js runtime. I've got a server running next that powers that. It listens for the request from the user. And then what I would say that the headless interaction is, is this, right? Me having any type of application, which could just be a web page out there, requesting data from the WordPress API, and then returning that data, and then you, yeah, deciding what you want to do with that and how you want to do it. So, um, and I think there's a lot of blend there too, like, because we can also have partially headless things. And I showed a couple of those last time where we may have a traditional WordPress site with headless features, right? That's rendered by a theme, but then the theme has some JavaScript in it that gets data from the API and makes an interaction that would have been uh, otherwise difficult to do a little bit easier. Yeah. So we're kind of taking advantage of usually writers familiarity with WordPress and, and the fact that they're dealing with user management and all password resets, all that garbage. Mm -hmm. And then we're being able to do different things on the front end, but without being kind of trapped maybe by the WordPress theme and methodology. Yes. And, and that is that is really what we hear. And so again, we're com coming from WP Engine's core kind of customer base, which is agencies and small businesses. And, and that's what we hear is that the people who are doing the writing want to use WordPress because they're familiar with it, because it's nice. It gives you all of those tools that, that you just mentioned. But the developer, on the other hand, wants a little bit more freedom, wants a little bit more flexibility. And I think what I found personally, and I'm just re kind of recalling the different projects and like the life cycle of headless stuff we worked on at VCU, it's like any time you wanted to do something a little bit more advanced with JavaScript, it became like a pain to work inside of the, the current theme paradigm. So I think this just really gives you, the developer, like a ton of flexibility and saying, this is how I'm going to make my thing. And then, you know, you've got pipes running down to the utilities and that that's what's supplying your water your electricity you know so like if we want to go back to our house metaphor that's kind of it you build your house you hook up to wordpress's you know data plumbing and get the data out and then you decide what you want to do with that where you want your light switches and all that stuff 
So just as a curiosity question, and then I'll let you get on with your stuff. <laughs> if I were insane, I could build a PHP based headless scenario that uses WordPress's XML. Would it count as would, would, would that be so, or false? Uh, yes, I, I, I think I think you're right. I mean, and, and really, we had this kind of discussion the other day uh, as a part of our in our like headless WordPress discord. Somebody was like, when would you say that this was like headless WordPress was born? And my answer was kind of like, you know, probably around the time the REST API was. But other people's opinions were really it was like the XML RPC was the original headless mechanism. Yeah. So like, I don't think you're insane. There were absolutely people who were doing that. And those early examples of like the WordPress.com iOS apps mm -hmm. where you could log in and manage your WordPress site all done through that XML RPC API. And I mean, if this is what we're saying is really it's just about using the data pipes of WordPress to do stuff like, I, you know, I think it's been going on a lot longer than, than we would say. But yeah, so I, I would call that headless. Thank you for indulging me. <laughs> yes. And I know, and I don't think you're insane either. Cause like after I was like, who would do this? And then a bunch of people were like, oh, I've done that. And I was like, okay, well, all right. Um, but I'm just checking. I'm just going to run over here and check the discord chat real quick. Yeah, exactly. And I think Taylor, Taylor has a good point. Like, and what I like about the headless thing is like, you don't, you, you can just use this with what, what technologies you're already familiar with and you don't necessarily need to go learn anything really specific about WordPress to do it as long as you're comfortable uh, just transacting through the API. Um, cool. Yeah, so let me, from there, let, let's, let's shut down the slideshow for just a second. So I know I mentioned this and I think this got thrown in the chat, uh, the JSON formatter uh, Chrome plugin really helpful. And then another tool that I'm going to be using today, I'm not actually sure how to say this. I think it's HTTP. Um, but if you open this up, it's just HTTP.io. And then this is really nice. And what this is, is this is an API client. And so this is going to help us facilitate some of the interaction with the WordPress API during, during today's session. And if you just click go to app, it should take you to the app and it's nice enough that like it saves all of my requests between uh, the different sessions where I've kind of like played around with stuff. Yeah. And Fran, it is a little bit easier than Postman and really great to get started. Postman, I think you've got to download or sign up for an account. Okay. So you can either do that or while we're using the REST API, the cool thing is since these are just URLs, I can just copy and paste them into the browser. And if I've got the JSON formatter plugin, it'll format that response for me. Um, so what I wanted to do was just sort of start at the base of the WordPress REST API and just like work our way up to sort of orient you to what this is and how you can use it. Um, so every word, since this is in core, unless you've like intentionally shut this off, and many of you may not know this, if you've got a WordPress site, you've already got an API up and running, unless you've intentionally shut it off. Um, so that sort of comes out of the box. Again, Gutenberg, the block editor, uses that extensively. So that's its mechanism for doing all of the cool or uncool, depending on your position, things that it does. Um, but for better or worse, that's what it uses. So I've got my website up here. Um, feel free, if you don't have a WordPress website to play around with, we can load test my server. And it's just jeffreyeverhart.com slash WPJSON right now. But if you've got your own, you know, it's kind of cooler to play around with and see what you've got in there. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and just make a request here, like this base, this base WP JSON URL. Because what this does is this sort of gives us an overview of the site. Like you can see the site name, the description, the URL, the home. So these are all things that are stored in that like site, site meta table. Um, but one important thing that it gives you also is this list of different namespaces. Right, because we have in here a huge list of stuff. And you can see that um, some of these are plugins like Yoast has created its own REST API namespace, a Kismet, Oembed. Um, I've got a bunch of other plugins installed from the WPMU dev folks that have APIs that they've tapped into and added on to the WordPress API. But the core WordPress REST API is available at this WP slash V2 uh, URL. So if I just append that, to the base that I'm working with already, just go to WP-V2. 
it's going to give me just sort of a slightly different response. Um, so that lists the namespace. And then what we also have inside of uh, this API namespace, right? So basically, this is a way for plugin uh, developers to essentially add on to the WordPress REST API without necessarily conflicting with anything else we're doing, right? So the same way we might namespace our code in PHP, we can do that in the REST API. And that's just a really clean way of ensuring that everything that WordPress core is doing isn't affected by something like what Gravity Forms is doing, what Yoast is doing. Um, so that's, that's the reason for that. Um, but what we can see here is once we've gotten past the namespace part, right, we get down into routes. And what gets listed for us in the response from this sort of base request are those routes. And it gives us some information about what we can do with them, right? So here, if we look at this one, wp slash v2 slash posts, I mentioned in the intro that REST APIs are built around this idea of collections, right? And so this is our collection of posts. If we want to get a list of posts, that's the URL that we use. Um, and then we can see here that we've got a couple of different methods. So when we start talking about APIs, and this really goes down one lower further into like HTTP, there are different methods. And if you're familiar with using PHP forms to do stuff, you're probably familiar with get and post, right? Get means I'm pulling something down from the server. Post typically means that I'm sending data to the server. So those are the two methods that are allowed on that particular route. Um, and getting the posts, obviously, like what we'll see in a second, is going to get me the posts, right? And if I want to create a new post from this, I can post data to that and it will create a new post. So let's dig into that and just sort of see what we get back. So we'll jump here into posts. Ah, it's already slowing down. That means people are doing stuff, which is, which is nice. Um, Okay, so here we are on just our basic posts route, and, and this is going to bring us back uh, a list of all of the posts. Well, not all of the posts, but some of them. I can't remember, uh, Tom, if you remember what the default is um, for that particular route, but... 10, I think. 10, okay, yeah. And so we got, so it's so a cool. So let's dig into this and just sort of see what we got. Because again, right... We're, we're getting back JSON data. And then the idea is that we would use this data in our application to do something. Like maybe if we kind of score, sort of collapse all this stuff down, like we can see that we get back this array of posts and here, all, you know, we can like loop through them. Maybe we make a, a post card for each one. That's pretty flexible. Um, and again, as developers, we can, we can do that sort of however we want. Um, so here we get some data for posts, like we get the ID, the date, and this is pretty much like all of the default data that I would get, the status, whether or not it's published, what type of resource it is, a link to it. We've got the title, uh, the content down here, uh, which again is a nested property. So we've got content and inside of that, we've got another object with this rendered key. And then that is the value. Uh, when we look at the value, that's basically like the HTML of our post, right? So whatever's stored in that post content field in your database for that post is what gets returned uh, by that part of the API. Um, we get an excerpt and similarly we get rendered. And then down here we start to get uh, into like other, other related data, right? So we're in posts, we're getting the data about the post, um, but down here we've got an author field with an ID, featured media with an ID, um, and so that's great, but that stuff typically isn't super helpful for us, right? Because if I wanted to display a web page, that that gets we get into those water that waterfall of requests that I talked about earlier, right? If we want to go get the author information, the featured media, we might need to make another request for those. If there's not another mechanism to include that stuff, like same with the categories, right? We get IDs to the categories, and so like let's just take this one for example. We'll just take category. Um, and let's do, let me just copy this URL real quick. And if you're smart, unlike me, there are, yeah, if you're smart like me, there are ways that you can sort of pre-populate this tool uh, with this URL so that you don't have to really rewrite it. Just be like WordPress API and you add your slash afterwards. So, um, so what we did there is we, we went out, right? We have this thing that's related to our initial post. 
and it gives us back this list of category IDs. Um, and we went out and did the same thing, right? So we said, we're gonna go to the categories collection. If we do that, instead of 15, it's gonna return us information on all of the categories in our WordPress instance. But then if we do a slash and pass in the ID of that particular entity, right, it's gonna narrow it down and only return that one. So we can see that that post is in the category Google Apps Script. Um, and so that's sort of the basics of how REST APIs work. We have these collections, each thing has its own unique ID, and we use that ID to uh, drill down and get data just about that thing, right? So if I, instead of getting my list of posts, I wanted to get just the data for this particular post, I'll pass that ID. And then you can see in there that that comes back way faster. My, my response size is much lower. Um, but still, like when we when we were talking about GraphQL and stuff like that, I mentioned that uh, th these were problems common with REST APIs, right? So WordPress actually gives you a way to get some of this additional data. So like if you're interested in using the REST API to, to build stuff and you don't want to have to make some of these multiple round trips to get a bunch of stuff, uh, let's see if I can come down here. We have, see in Yoast, we'll add stuff. And so this is also something to point out too. Like you can see here that I've got these two additional fields that are added to my REST API response that are specific to plugins that I have installed, right? So I've got ACF installed on my website. I don't have any uh, custom fields on this particular page, but if I did, those would show up in, in that key right there. Same with the Yoast head for SEO purposes. Um, and we can see that I get back, honestly, just a ton of junk that I don't really want, which is, again, part of the problem with the REST API. But what WordPress does give you, give you is this underscore links key. And if you sort of drill through this, what this does is it gives you links to a bunch of those related pieces of content. So it gives you a link to the, to the self, to the thing that I just uh, asked for, right? It gives us a link to one step back in the API, the collection. Um, if I wanted to learn more about that post type, I could do that right there. But it also includes links to things like the author, the replies, version history, featured media, attachment, terms, which are categories. And so if I want to optionally include some of those things in my REST API response, um, we can see that down here, each one of those things, well, not each one, but several of these down here have this embeddable true uh, key value, right? So we're saying that this is embeddable. And what that means is that if up here we add a query parameter and we just say underscore embed, that when we get that stuff back, instead of just including those links, um, if we come down, I think we got to go all the way to the bottom. I'm just trying to close this up too. Yeah, we get this embedded data that comes back, right? So if we want to include certain things that aren't available in the default REST API response, using that embed query parameter will bring you back things like the author, the replies, or the comments, the WP featured media, um, and, and so on and so forth. We got our, our terms, right, which before we had to go out and get from a separate API. Um, so that's really helpful if that's, that's kind of what you want to do and you're stuck and you want to use the REST API, but don't want to have to make all these round trips to reconstruct uh, your particular page. So that's a, that's a decent trick. Um, and then another one that I'll also talk about real quick is the idea of filtering. Um, and so that's another query param that we can throw up here. And so we can say, uh, let me just check the docs real quick presentation. Yeah, fee, sorry, fields is what I'm looking for, not filtering. Um, that's what this is going to do. So we can say here, we just want, I don't know, let's just say the title. And send that back, right? And we get, um, by, by using this field RAM, we can then pass in a comma separated list of just the fields that we want back. So if we're getting too much content, we wanna limit the amount of data that we're getting back so that we don't have to parse it or traverse it, we can, we can do that and just sort of expand on our example there. So like we wanted to add the date, you know, we can do that too. Um, so that's sort of a, a decent deep dive. Tom, 
how are we doing? Any questions, anything you want me to think no, I can that's, back that's, over or explain? I think it's making good sense. I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. I think, you know, just trying to figure out what your parameters are that you can mess around with in that is key. I threw just as an example, the per page thing. Yeah. So you can custom set that. Um, the other things I think tend to come up is like, and categories, you know, as a query parameter. Um, so you can do stuff like that, um, which is certainly not as fancy as GraphQL, but it does help you limit things a little bit in terms of what you're asking for. Yep, for, for sure, for sure. And and that's, I think, all part of what I'm trying to do here is just sort of draw parallels between, you know, how you solve some of these problems in a couple of different ways. Um, so that maybe is a good spot for me to switch gears just a little bit and talk about WP GraphQL because like they are very, two very different uh, things. They have two very different approaches. Uh, and so I think it's kind of worth, worth talking about just a little bit. So what I'm going to do first is just hop out to the WP GraphQL website. And so I lied. We've got one more like sort of architectural diagram. Um, that, that we'll walk through. And this isn't super detailed. because like, I don't know that you need to fully understand like graph theory to use WP GraphQL, but I think that's the idea, right? Where in REST, we have these collections. You've got slash posts, which is where your posts are, slash pages, which is where your pages are, uh, so on and so forth, right? With GraphQL, it essentially looks at all of these different content types and all of their attributes, right? So if we've got a post, it's got a title, and the title's got a particular piece of content inside of it, right? And what GraphQL does is it sort of reconstructs a graph of all of these different types and how they can be related. And so in graph theory and in GraphQL, those are called nodes and edges. So your nodes are your individual content types. So like a post is a node, a category is a node, an image is a node, uh, you know, a post, an image, like, and we, we sort of just sort of repeat these things and we can see that, you know, one post might be related to two different categories and that relationship between the two is called an edge. So we have nodes, which are things uh, inside of your WordPress database, like the things that most likely make up your collections. And then we have edges, which are the relationships between them. And so what GraphQL allows us to do is to essentially specify a query that says, well, you know, I want to get this post and then I want to get uh, these other associated categories, or maybe the images. And there's a lot of, uh, of ways that we can do that. So let me see where I'm at in here. Yeah, I'm going to hop back over to my website. Um, and I feel ashamed at how many comments I have on answers. So like, don't, if you have a question, <laughs> throw in Discord, don't comment on my website. Uh, it's it's going to go and go into that black hole. Um, so what we can do here, I'm just going to hop back into GraphQL for just a second, see if I can, yeah, clear that out. All right. So again, like I mentioned in the, in the beginning, the REST API built in to core, right? I didn't have to do any installation. And unless you turn it off, you can do what I just did with HTTP. You can go find your WordPress website, start messing around with some of this stuff uh, on the fly, and you shouldn't have to do anything. GraphQL or WP GraphQL, on the other hand, is an open source plugin. It has a really great community uh, behind it. And, you know, we get the chance at, at WP Engine to work with sort of the, the lead maintainer, uh, Jason Ball. He's been working on that plugin for a long time and super knowledgeable person and a lot of really, really uh, smart people working on creating other extensions uh, that go on to GraphQL for things like Gravity Forms and ACF so that all of the data that you have in your WordPress site is available via this same interface, right? So if you go, you go into plugins uh, and I'll just walk us through this really quick. So we'll go add new, I already have it installed, but you know, if you WP GraphQL, uh, that is cool, PHP elephant. So you go ahead and activate that. Um, and then that should get you set up like this. There are really only a couple of settings that you might want to check. With GraphQL, instead of having multiple endpoints like we do here, like we've got posts, we've got pages, we've got things like that, WP GraphQL and GraphQL in general sort of just gives you one endpoint, right? And it's the GraphQL endpoint. 
because again, we're sending queries to this and we're not requesting particular resources. Um, so that's pretty much okay as default. What I would definitely recommend doing, if you're worried about people getting at this, you can sort of limit it to authenticated requests, um, which isn't a big deal. I'm not sure you need to do, um, but if you want to, you certainly can. And then what I would also do is enable the GraphQL graphical IDE, which is on by default, but then also enable GraphQL debug mode. Just as you're playing around with it, it's kind of nice. It'll give you errors if you make uh, a wrongly formatted query or something like that. So I'm just gonna save that and then hop back to the graphical IDE. Um, and so what I can do from here is this is kind of like, uh, I don't know, MySQL Workbench or something like that, that allows you to visually compose some of these GraphQL queries and like preview them in real time against your data. So if I open up this query composer window, we can see that it's pre-populated with all of the different like content nodes that are in here. So we've got comment, we've got comments, you know, menu, menus, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll start with something simple and we'll just go down to posts, right? So if I select posts and open that, that list, we can see that the graphical ID is going to start creating a query for me in this second window. And so from here, I'm going to dig down into those individual nodes. Um, and then I'm just going to select a couple of different things. Like I could do content, date, um, we'll do title. And that's pretty basic. I'm just going to reorganize these in a way that I like them because that is kind of one thing. It's maybe we want the, it's just a little bit more readable the way I'm going to do this. Um, and as you can see too, as I'm typing in here, I also start, start to get auto complete, auto complete as I do that. Um, but from there, I can also dig into other related content types, right? So this is all stuff that's on a, on a piece of post data. And I'll just run this query so we can see what we get back, right? So we get you know, JSON that is structured in this way. We've got posts and then inside that we've got nodes and that's an array of all of the data that we asked for in exactly the shape that we asked for it, right? There's nothing more, there's nothing less. We get just title, date, and content. Um, so that's kind of neat because again, we get to specify what we want. It gives us back to it in the shape uh, of the query that we made. So that's kind of nice. Like there's not this I don't have to go and limit data. I need to tell it what I want and it brings me back just that. Um, and so if you are dealing with something where like you have constrained bandwidth or like you're on a mobile device or whatever, and you wanna make this as fast as possible, you know, eliminating some of those fields either through using GraphQL or what I showed you over here with the REST API where we use fields to like whittle down our default response is, is a really good idea. Cause it also makes your response faster too, right? Each one of those things that are in this JSON object is something that the database has got to go pull and, you know, return for you. So the fewer things you ask for, the fewer operations it has to do on the back end and, and the faster it's going to be. But that's what I like about WP GraphQL is it's sort of like lets us get at some of this other content. So like on my website, obviously, like I'm the only author here, um, but if I wanted to come in here, I can get the author's name. Uh, I don't know, their user ID or whatever. I can do that and that's just gonna add it onto my request. And so I scroll down after the content. I'm actually just gonna delete the content because that's just obscure in our view and not that important. You know, we can see what that JSON looks like. We still get our nodes array back, our title for each, each thing, the date it was published. Then we get this author key with its own sort of node structure and then Clearly, you can see I've been reading my kids too many stories and tried to obscure my identity, and I will now be referred to as Brown Bear. Um, but again, super helpful and, and just kind of offers you another option um, if you're if you're wanting to work with with this type of data. Um, and so let me hop back now. So this is sort of graphical, and this is how you might go about creating a query. And now, like I did say that there is a little bit of added complexity with this path, just depending on what tools you're using. Because I think this is a, what I'm about to say is highly dependent on sort of what you're using to create, uh, you know, this part of your headless WordPress stack. Because for some people who've been using GraphQL a long time and who are coming from outside the WordPress ecosystem, like there's a lot of tooling around making GraphQL queries that they can just bolt on and adopt. Where if you're not and you're kind of like in the WordPress world and, you know, aren't as familiar with that, 
you might need to go install some packages or use some JavaScript libraries to help you help you do some of that. But you can actually just submit some of those queries via a post request. Um, and so like I kind of took some time the other day to format one of those. And here you can see this query that I'm making, right? So I'm saying, here's my query. I, I want to get the first 10 post posts, and then I want to get, you know, the author's name, the date, the content, the featured image, the media item URL, uh, and then the URI for the post, right? Whatever link that is. And so I'm just going to go ahead and send that off. Um, and we'll see what we get back. And, you know, we get back sort of data that's shaped exactly like our query, right? We've got our list here, we've got our, our 10 post objects. And then if we drill down inside of them, we've got our author information, date, content, uh, so on and so forth, right? Featured image with the media item URL, the title of that, and then the URI to the post based on however I've set up my WordPress permalinks. Okay, and so I, what I'm looking at down here is really like how much data we've transferred and how long that request took. Um, so we've got 125 kilobytes, eight. 830 milliseconds, which is still, you know, that's not super fast, but it's pretty fast. It's less than a second and it's 125 kilobytes. So that's not a ton of stuff. Um, and what I tried to do over here was to sort of uh, like echo out that same query, right? So if I want to get the same stuff that I just got back using the REST API, this is kind of how I'd have to do it. Like I think Tom illuminated for us that maybe this per page 10 is already the default. So maybe we don't need that. But here we've got to use that fields parameter to limit, you know, saying I just want the title, the date, the slug, the content, and the links. And then we're going to embed that author data, right? Just like we did to get in, get in this one. Um, we'll send that back. And so, yeah, that was actually slightly faster, which is very cool, right? But 197 kilobytes um, and 596 milliseconds to serve that request. Um, but what I'm going to do here is I'm actually just going to take this, like, so let's say we didn't do that and we just send this sort of basic request. Let's see what that looks like. You know, we're at 227 kilobytes, 587 milliseconds, still pretty fast. Um, and then we could come down here and I'm going to do, and then we're going to embed this stuff, right? Because we need our featured media. We need our author information. Um, and so here's where stuff can can start to sort of get get way bigger, right? We're at almost 500 kilobytes up to nine nine oh seven milliseconds. Um, so it's really at that point, you know, we can see that for for requests like these, the performance is uh, you know somewhat comparable. We've obviously got to go through a bunch of hoops if we want to get the data shaped the, the way we want, or like eliminate some of those extra fields. Um, and in some cases, that's not entirely necessary, right? If you're building a small enough focused thing, like you pulling down additional data and just sort of discarding it uh, doesn't really make a huge difference. I think it all just kind of goes back down to like what performance metrics you want for whatever it is that you're building and like what they expect. Um, so cool, I'm trying to think, anybody got any questions want to throw in there? Um, throw in the Discord. Or Tom, if you've got anything you think I should circle back on. I don't, but I do want to note that I'd never removed information from the REST API before. So just seeing that was handy and I've used it a million times. I just always added stuff. Yeah. So, you know. Well, and I actually went through because like we had an internal example that sort of illustrates like this uh, this interaction, right? Uh, that I had to sort of revise because I mean the, this this actually wasn't something I I really found until I started doing uh, I'd used the embed before but mm -hmm. I'd never used the fields to remove stuff until I started doing research for this and like I, I sat there and I was like well let me you know th think about how fast I can make these and like do that sort of comparison between WP GraphQL so it is handy and it's good to know that it's there because like some of the time what it does give you, it's an insane amount of data that you don't need. So if you can sort of, if you're only looking for a couple of things, throwing that on there, I think will just save you some kilobytes, which is, you know, I guess we can be good data stewards uh, when we're building web, web experiences for folks. But the only thing that I'll mention here too, while we're looking at this, so I mentioned that there are a couple of different ways to do uh, GraphQL stuff. 
And what I'll throw you at too, and I don't know if we'll have time to get at it today, um, but if you all want to take a look at our website, the developers.wpengine.com website, this is where um, we we publish all of our all of our headless focus content, um, and we have this thing called the headless WordPress developer roadmap. So if you're interested in like doing a little bit, you know, more like headless work that is I guess more geared toward what I'm saying about WP Engine's hosting setup, right? Using these full stack JavaScript frameworks or even really just JavaScript libraries like React or Vue on the front end, we've got like a step-by-step -step guide that'll sort of build up your experience level as we go. And one of the real, so there's an introduction to GraphQL and WordPress tutorial and blog posts out there that's definitely worth a watch if you're interested as well. Um, but this crash course is really interesting and I'll sort of just show it and maybe we can circle back around because um, it's all built in code sandbox it was done by my colleague Grace. Um, and what this does is sort of just walks you step by step through creating a GraphQL focused like React application that renders these WordPress posts. Um, well, we so do like have said, a question there, Jeff, that relates oh, yeah. to that because I saw Apollo. Uh, Apollo. Um, so Fran, the dev, weighs in with. Uh, in your opinion, what does the Apollo client need to enhance its GraphQL dev experience? Yeah, so I got to call Fran Fran out. Fran is absolutely a plant. Um, if you okay. look at here, he's he, he works with me. Right. Um, but but sir, Fran, yeah. So I'll definitely answer that because I think that's a really good question too. Because when you're building certain types of apps, you know, like there's added complexity in introducing some of these packages, like Apollo client, which is what Fran's talking about and actually what is used in this tutorial, right? Um, so let's see if I can, oh man, I got back. I had to show Frayne's picture. Yeah, and so we use Apollo Client for data fetching and that sort of simplifies a lot of this interaction. Um, and if we look at, well, I guess this is the start thing. I'd have to go through the whole tutorial to do that. Um, I'll see if I can just sort of scroll down and get us a code example. So when we configure this Apollo Client, um, we can pass it certain parameters, right? And one of those is this idea of an in-memory cache. And what that allows us to do is to basically store the results of those queries in the memory of our application so that if we re-go to that page, it doesn't need to refetch that data. So there's all these like little optimizations that you can get um, by, by introducing some of these tools like Apollo Client. So like tooling built around that, um, and, and you can see in this example, because like I always like to start with the simplest way to do stuff, right? And so if we look at interacting with GraphQL, what I'm doing here is I've got a post request queued up as opposed to a Git request. And then um, I'm, I'm sending this off as a part of the post body. Now, this took me a long time to format in a way that the GraphQL API would accept uh, because I'm just doing it as a string, right? And there's a bunch of other stuff too that we can do inside of WP GraphQL. Uh, if I hop back in here, so like I'm in, I was looking at posts plural, but if I sort of close that out and I look at post, um, you know, if I pass it an ID, you know, we can we can basically in the same way you can with SQL, you can parameterize some of these queries and pass in variables. Uh, let me for a good one. Yeah, there we go. 2466. We can pass in variables to get just specific resources, right? So here, if I say I want the post with the ID of 2466, and I open up this select down and I can select which type of ID. And this is an important thing if you're going to get started with WP GraphQL. This threw me off when I got started, right? Because I've, I've been focused on traditional WordPress for a long time. So things only had one ID. Uh, but in WP GraphQL, you have something called the database ID, which is the ID that you would think of. And then you have this separate ID. And what that, the reason behind that is because uh, for each one of these content items here, WP GraphQL creates a completely unique ID for just that thing. So like where I might have a, a post with the ID of 2466, I could also have a page with the ID of 2466. So it does that as a part of its own like backend mechanisms just to make finding some of those resources faster. But I can also look up this up by the slug or the URI. Um, so like I'll do that and we'll just throw some fields on here like date. Um, 
title and content. Yeah, and so we throw that in there and then we just get back that data for that one particular post um, because we've sort of, you know, passed this variable in there. And so going back to Fran's question about, you know, what what is sort what do you get by opting into this Apollo framework if you're going to use WP GraphQL is it makes things like that really easy. Like uh, if we look at sort of that example in this, I think if we come down here, we can see a really quick example, right? We're getting all posts and here we, you know, format that query with backticks, which is way nicer than what I had to do to make it work over this basic post request, right? I was able essentially in this case, able to take this query that I've composed over here, copy it into this backticks in my program, and then just pass that in, um, pass that in right there. But if we sort of scroll down, eventually we work on getting a post details page, right? And so we can see that we basically sort of create this query that looks a lot like a function. We're passing in this ID and we're using it inside of the query. And then when we do that, uh, you know, we, we call it use query, pass it to query, and then we pass in the variables like that. So it kind of makes it a little bit more flexible and Apollo, Apollo client lets you do that in like a much nicer way than what I'm illustrating here. Like I couldn't even imagine trying to have to write that, that variable query in, in this mechanism without having uh, that library do some of the formatting for me. Um, but yes, the memcache, the in-memory cache is, is really great. And like I said, it just makes everything way faster. So if like you load a particular query and you get all the data back, it just remembers that you've already loaded that. And so the next time you go to that page it says, hey, I've made this query before. Um, let me use this data that I already have instead of hitting your API again. So it's faster for the users. It's less load on your server. Um, and there's also like settings you can set about how long you want that data to remain valid. And, you know, so like if it never changes or it's only going to change once a week, cool, cache that for basically ever. Um, but if it's a little bit, if, it, if you need to invalidate it more frequently than that, you can. But yeah, thanks, Fran. And stoke the friends here. So um cool any other questions or things you think you want to loop back over tom i just might highlight like you say writing that thing was so hard to do by hand is is that a good rule of thumb like if it's miserable and hard there's probably a better you know system set up someplace that's that's going to help you there uh yeah i mean in and in this case for sure so if it was me like I would never, if I'm going to use GraphQL, and again, this is, this is, that's a tough question to answer. Like, yes, there's a, probably a better solution out there. Um, so for sure, like Apollo client, if you're going to write something in JavaScript, you might as well include that and get some of those performance benefits and also those developer experience benefits. Um, and like, yeah, I would recommend it. Just know that it's, you know, when we think about that, like simplistic, simplistic to complex thing, like, you're adding another package, you're going to have to learn some stuff specific to that piece of technology. And so like, and, and, and a lot of times with, with developers, right, that becomes the, it's tough to know, like, what do I invest time in learning? What's stable? Um, what's going to change, right? So GraphQL is, is fairly stable as a spec. You know, there's an actual spec out there that says, this is how things should implement GraphQL. WP GraphQL tries to follow that pretty closely. And like in terms of clients, uh, Apollo is probably the most popular um, and definitely what I would recommend if you're going to look at one and you're like, hey, I like this and I want to use it and I want to do it inside of an application, then yeah, that's that's what I would go to because it's just, it would be miserable to do this otherwise. And it was really just me having to like get the query in a way. And it's also tough for me to realize like, is that a limitation of this tool? Or, you know, if I was doing this in code, would it have been as difficult? And that I don't know the answer to, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it's like when you pointed out the JSON formatter for Chrome. Like, if something feels mm -hmm. like really off and horrible, like, take a minute, look around, ask somebody. Don't just suffer eternally, <laughs> right? Yes, yes. Yeah, don't pay the blood price unless there's, like, dot knowledge at the end of the well. Um for sure. And that's also why I think this fields thing is so handy because like Tom and we've talked about this a million times, just like how many times you forget that like content has a rendered key inside of it or like just trying to figure out how to traverse 
like all of the JSON that gets returned sometimes can be super painful. So like if you can exclude a bunch of that, it just makes it easier for you to store in your brain mentally, where it's like, if I know I only have these four or five fields, it's a lot easier for me to reason about this object than it is if I'm like, oh man, like, you know, like, I don't know, let me go hit that again and just get the basics. Cause like, we'll just see, it's just like a ton of junk. You know, I'm getting back like yo stuff that I don't necessarily want. And so for me, that that's always what I look to do, right? If I'm like, ever find myself like, drown and for lack of a better term like I'm, I'm like how can i reduce the complexity of this so it's easier to reason about maybe that's redoing the fields if you're doing graphql stuff maybe it's reaching for apollo because like it just handles a bunch of that for you and you can just take what graphical gives you over here and basically just plunk that into your application inside of some backticks pass it into this function and like you'll get the data back that's shaped exactly like this so that part of the developer experience is, is super slick in my opinion. Beautiful point. Simplify the data first. And then when you're parsing and building with it, your life becomes much, much easier. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. All right. Well, cool. Uh, so we want to jump in. I mean, we're at about two o'clock right now. If we got any other questions in discord that people want to pop in there, feel free and I'll answer them. If not, I know Tom, I think you had, maybe some examples you wanted to talk through and I, I did as well. So we could kind of switch gears and talk about a couple of different headless things. And like, I've got a couple of API focused things because one thing I wanted to talk about when we get there is just like, I know you talked about extending the REST API responses, but we can also create our own stuff. So it's kind of a neat way where you can use WordPress basically as your REST API framework. Uh, instead of like Express or Node or Laravel or whatever, like you can just use the WordPress you already know and love. I think um, Taylor's going to help me out. Yeah. So the site you're looking at this on probably is is a headless WordPress site. So Michael Branson Smith is the one that did the design and front end, you know, trying to mimic pretty hard. Uh, kind of a reader's digest type of vibe. Uh, and he did this a while back. So we've done a couple different iterations of the site, but it's, you know, it's exactly what we've talked about here. Uh, it's REST API to a JavaScript front end that's doing all this stuff. And in this case, pretty simple stuff, but we have kind of what you'd expect. Um, so I'll throw this in here in case anyone wants to look at it. But what you see in there is, um, is just the API. In this case, we set the per page to 99. And we have said limit the return to things with the category ID of 214. Um, you can see that in the URL parameters. Now, <laughs> now that Jeff has told me about limiting some fields, we can make <laughs> a bunch of this stuff out. Um, and I think we probably should. Um, because basically most of what we're doing is with this ACF data. Um, you know, we could probably remove 90% of the rest of it and, and still be good to go. But that's that's all that's happening. And ACF lets you, um, these are the fields, you know, so we can build out really extensive fields with all sorts of data validation stuff. Um, that return different things depending on what we want in this, this API. Um, and it does it, in this case, you could say like just show in REST API. It's got a little button that you can decide to flick um, there. Uh, we don't have it on this one, but only because uh, I turned it off because we did a bunch of odd things and I didn't want people accidentally turning it off and on and you know, we got a little more custom in terms of what was returning than what the ACF uh, API returned. So in any case, that's that's what's driving this site. And we've done it at all sorts of levels of complexities for different conferences. You know, for this headless one, we have two events. So it's not uh, not all that exciting in terms of data, but we've done much larger conferences over multiple days for like Alt in the UK and some things like that. It's worked really nicely and it's allowed uh, Michael Branson Smith to build, you know, kind of in an environment where he was comfortable 
and knew how to do things. Yeah. Because he just didn't need all the stuff of WordPress. He just wanted yeah. this stuff. That's cool. And can I jump in there on, a, yeah. on that ACF note for just a second? Because like I think one of the cool trends that having having been doing this stuff for at least the last five or six years in the WordPress space with the APIs and, and whatnot, it's cool to see that still trending in like, towards a more API focused route, I guess. Cause like, I remember when like the rest API got merged into core, like we, there used to, we used to need a plugin or something, right. To add the ACF junk to yeah. um, the rest API. And now that's just like a button. Uh, and I think similarly, like, so uh, WP engine recently acquired like a bunch of the delicious brains plugins, uh, ACF included. And so like, for, for us as developers, like, it's cool to see that because like, I'm not going to like spoil any feature releases or anything like that. But I think you can probably expect that if you are interested in using GraphQL uh, and ACF, like right now, you similarly, you need a, uh, an additional extension to make all that data available to WP GraphQL. And so I just feel like more and more things are trending where those integrations are just going to sort of come out of the box. And like, I know Gravity Forms is another really good one that's got a you know, really robust REST API that you can use. Yeah, and I, I don't know. We can, I think what I would like to do is I'll show one more example um, only because uh, now that you talk to me about limiting the fields, I want to revisit this. <sighs> oh, are you going to make this faster? So... Yeah, this was, and this is another thing maybe that plays into this idea of APIs um, and when you use the headless stuff. Because what I was trying to do here is make the fastest site load I could. Um, and so I, I was, you know, kind of getting down to like, what do I got here? What, what do I do to improve performance? Um, in this case, in the idea that speed equals energy efficiency, because that's what the topic of this was. Um, and so we have a pretty, you know, simple site, but with the goal of it just being super fast, you can see down at the bottom, like the load times and, and whatnot, but this is using WordPress, which is what our people were familiar with writing with, but then trying to take that front end and be able to be like, all right, what's the, what's the barest bones we can get this down to. And it even does some like brute force caching in that each time a new post was published, it just writes the JSON like directly to a folder, which is tied to the site rather than even doing kind of the more manual requests from WordPress. So you get the idea like once you abstract that data out, then you have more and more opportunities to do really specific things that you want while still taking advantage of the ubiquity of the WordPress authoring um, feel, vibe and experience with people. Yeah, and, and that's really cool that you're talking about caching because I stumbled on, oh, man, and I don't remember exactly the URL. Maybe it's like medicalnewstoday.com or something like that. This was a question that got posted in the advanced WordPress face group, and it was headless, but I chimed in for a different reason. Uh, and you'll like this, Tom, because it's like a massive multi-site. So there's like medical news today, which I think is what it was, but there was like six other health-focused websites that were all being published in this same multi-site environment that were feeding all of these different sites headlessly. And like, when we're talking about scale, like that's massive, right? I mean, that's a big site. Um, and they were doing something similar, I think, with their data where they would get it from the API and then sort of just cache it as JSON as an intermediary step somewhere. Um, and then serving that up. And their, their question was more around like, the database structure, right? I think that was their problem was they had all these authors, like the same stuff we did with Rampages, where it was like it needed sharding basically. Um, but it was just, it, it's really interesting because I do think like that caching thing it is something that more and more people are talking about. And so they're, they're approaching that problem in a couple of different ways. I know WP Engine internally is working on something to like accelerate that content to basically do that, right? When you when you update your data in WordPress, then we like echo that out to an edge CDN somewhere so that when your app asks for it, it's getting this already processed JSON from like the closest available server. 
And then we just had a, a couple of guests on our, our podcast a few weeks ago who have a company that does that specifically for GraphQL. So like they've got a WordPress plugin and you can have this GraphQL cache of data at the edge that you can request. And so like, I'm kind of like, man, how could you get that under a hundred milliseconds if we threw you on the edge? Yeah. And this was like, definitely like primitive mud hut building stuff, but you know, like it, it was fun. It was fun to roll it back to basics and mess around with stuff and not have, you know, what is really a huge overhead of developing WordPress themes yeah. that are real themes and just be able to go like, you know, bare bones. Um, yeah. It's kind of nice. Yeah. Super fun. So cool. you have, you have a podcast. Yeah. Yeah. I'll throw the link in there. Fran and I are, are hosting this podcast now. So we've had some cool, some cool guests on, um, that company was named, it was formerly named graph CDN. Now they're called Stellate. Um, but we've also talked with the people who build Next.js. Um, we've got a bunch of other folks lined up that I think are, are cool. If you're interested in like this API driven headless sort of WordPress development space, yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff out there. Um, and me and Fran just have a great time like talking to these people. Uh, I'm trying to think, Fran, anybody else coming up that who, who else are we talking to? Uh, if anybody's heard of Astro, which is a new framework. Uh, that's just sort of busted onto the scene. We're going to talk to their creator soon. Um, but this this would be kind of nice. So if you're looking for like the next up and coming thing that's simple and a lot simpler than things like Next.js, this this is where I'd look. It's sort of made for, it, it sounds like it's almost made for doing headless WordPress stuff where it's just like, I want super fast websites without a bunch of JavaScript overhead and like, you know, getting results kind of like what you got with the digital detox stuff. Um, so yeah, that, that's, if you haven't checked it out, I threw a link in the, in the discord yeah, and friends, like kind of roll through a couple of the guests we got coming on, but I got a couple of, of things we can roll through really quickly that sort of center. If, if that's good with you, Tom. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, let me go back. Let's go back here. So this is, Maybe like one of the early, I don't know, can we see a date on this? 2020, that was the latest commit. I don't know when we made this thing. But so I went back to the, like the REST API, right? And if we go back all the way here and look at our namespaces, uh, that means that we as developers of WordPress plugins also have the ability to basically tap into a bunch of the mechanisms that WordPress creates for its own API and use those to build our own applications. So like, I know at one point in time, uh, when Tom and I were at VCU, we had this super massive multi-site instance called Rampages. And like, we would need to get data about this thing. And like, you know, I, at that point we were exploring what the API could give us. And so this is sort of a really quick and dirty example of a really basic plugin that I made that would give us stats about our multi-site network. Um, and so we can see here that this is just like one, two PHP files, like less than a hundred lines of code really, uh, to do this stuff. And so like I'm adding a menu page to the admin dashboard, but down here I have this, uh, function that taps into the rest API init hook, which is, you know, as WordPress is going through its lifecycle hooks, we hit this rest API init one. And that's where we as developers can tap into it and register additional rest routes onto the WordPress API. And so you can see really that this part of it is, is super simple. So like I've got, you know, this add action thing that if you've done any kind of plugin or theme development, like you've definitely seen add action. And then inside of this function, I just call another function called register rest route. I pass it in the namespace that I want for my plugin and then the route that uh, I'm actually registering. So like in this example, you know, you do WP, dash json slash rampages dash data slash v1 slash data to, to get that invoke that route i tell it what method to respond to and then i pass it this callback function and so this callback function is what gets run whenever i hit that route via the you know via my code or via the browser and it runs this function called collect rampages data and it basically just runs these other functions down here 
that would go into the SQL database and sort of just get us some aggregate statistics about how many users registered and break it down by month so that we could then sort of just chart it out. Um, but it was, again, one of those things where it was like to build a whole and like, so, so really, you know, if we look at this, we've got just a couple of functions like this 88 lines. And then this part to actually add a rest route was like 10 lines of code. Um, and then if I look at my interface, I forget what I did here, you know, nothing crazy. I think I used view, which was, was, and sort of still is my go-to. Um, but again, it was really easy for me to create this nice interactive dashboard with view. And then down here somewhere, whenever this page loads, uh, this refresh data. Yeah, refresh. I call this refresh data function. It goes and gets that data from the WordPress API and then sort of populates my JavaScript app with all the data that I got back. And, you know, this was something I feel like, I mean, it might, might have taken me like a day or half a day or whatever to whip this up because it was like all of these things were tools that I was really productive with. Like I knew Vue really well. I'd use this charting library a lot. So building this was really simple. And then getting the data out was kind of equally as simple because of what WordPress gives me. Um, so that's a cool thing and definitely something you should kind of consider if you're like, ah, oh, you know, I want this data. Like it doesn't need to be something that WordPress provides for you. Uh, you can easily add on your own namespace and your own routes to go and do like whatever crazy stuff you want. So like you see here, we're just, I'm pretty much just executing raw SQL queries against the database because we had like 35,000 sites. And it was just like, there was everything else would have been too slow uh, to actually sort of be usable. Um, and so that's kind of one good example. And then I'll give another one, which is also something that we worked on at BCU that like we prototyped and I don't think ever really saw the light of day, but it was kind of neat. Well, before, um, can I stop you real oh, quick? Yeah, yeah, Jeff? please. I, I think like if we've got people who are doing domain of one's own setups or looking to structure, like how, what's the data around proving this stuff is successful, either within a multi-site or with all these individual sites, I think what you just said that you can kind of stick data at these endpoints in ways that are serviceable for you. Like it's not a whole lot of programming, it's really straightforward. And then it just opens up the doors for running automated reporting and things like that in ways that are really nice. You know, you want to see how many posts, how many pages you want to get, um, you know, was this a faculty member or student? you can set all that stuff to be part of your registration process and written into the, the API return uh, in ways that then allow you to run reports and do some really nice things. And we did some basic stuff with that, but it's, it's I think, an invaluable tool down the line to make some really nice interactive stuff, much like you did with the multi-site, um, but really catered to institutional needs and however you're defining success in, in that realm. So, yeah, for sure. For sure. And so this other example is a little bit more fanciful. I think we like made this right as like COVID popped off and VCU, the, the institution sent everybody home and it was like, well, what do we do for these folks who maybe don't have reliable internet? Um, and so the idea was that we would create, uh, some sort of like crowdsource Wi-Fi map uh, using WordPress. I think they, they like said no because it was a security thing, right? I, I don't remember why they knocked it down. but So this never really saw the light of day, but it was a great proof of concept because it sort of combines a bunch of the stuff that I'm talking about. Um, it's obviously sort of like a partially headless WordPress site. And this one's a little bit different. Um, and again, so like if I go back to this diagram, you know, th this is kind of debatable on what, what makes a headless WordPress site headless. And so like, I, I tend to use the term partially headless because like things can use headless features like the API, but then ultimately still be delivered by the content management system. And so this is kind of a good example of that where a lot of the headless stuff we're building at WP Engine is like meant to run on its own server, right? Like I've got a whole server over here that does its own thing and then just talks to WordPress where this example kind of combines the two a little bit and where what I'm doing 
is I think if we look, this is actually a theme. Um, and I want to say if you look at like the index.php thing, like this is it. I'm basically, I'm doing get, get header, get footer. I've got one div with an ID of app. And basically I'm using that to just ship this JavaScript component, this JavaScript application down there using Vue, right? So this is like a single page app that's all built with Vue. WordPress's sole responsibility as far as this theme goes is to just like ship that initial HTML in the JavaScript and then it renders and basically takes over and WordPress doesn't really do anything at that point uh, through the typical WordPress mechanisms, right? And we do all that stuff through the API. Um, and so like if I come over here and search add access point or go to add access point, uh, it's gonna take a second and I've since moved from Virginia. So it'll let's look up VCU real quick and it's gonna locate me here in Florida. And then I can pick an out, I can pick a location, fill out the details here and just be like, is some Wi-Fi. Right, and so that's a nice form, nice interaction. I click save location. This JavaScript app is gonna post that data back to a WordPress API endpoint and save it for us. So we do that, we get our nice fancy, like this location's been added. And if I come up here and do search, it'll sort of just return us a list view of those particular things. I think what I actually set this one to do was like, it looks at, your your latitude and longitude and gives you like a a certain radius of stuff right so we can kind of see that and like you know get driving directions i'm not sure that part works or it's not going to work for me because i'm probably too far away right now um, but it was a really neat sort of like interactive type app that i made stores really non kind of traditional data um, all sort of modeled around post types and so most of that stuff, all the front end junk is in this source folder. And like, if we look at this one, this is where it does the posting off to uh, add a new location. You know, it's gonna get the WordPress site URL, uh, go to this CrowdFi endpoint, submit a map point and post all the data that I tell it to um, over there. And then if we look at my API endpoints, you know, those are, I wanna say, index.php, it's in functions.php is where I sort of load these. Like we register a couple of post types um, and then I initialize that REST API and add, add the, this function to it, this map point controller, right? And this is what essentially controls, there's one file that sort of controls everything that happens at that endpoint because we're both getting data when we load those map points and creating entries, right? When we post something off to that endpoint. Um, and there are a bunch of really handy sort of resources that you can use in here if you're trying to do that. And we see that a lot of this looks pretty similar to uh, what we saw in the other example, right? Where we've got like a register rest route function. And I'm saying, all right, we're going to register it at this namespace, at this endpoint. And then here's how we're going to register it, right? We're going to accept a post request. Then we're going to do a callback uh, to create the item down here. Uh, which just takes the JSON we get from our front end application. And then we just call WP insert post and it inserts the, you know, just a regular custom post type and then returns like an all good signal. Uh, but what we can also do here is like, uh, it'll let you do permission callbacks. So I think that's one of the good things to talk about too when we talk about the API is that, and this is the same with WP GraphQL. Right. So just because the API is available doesn't mean that everybody has permission to do everything. Um, and I think I'll hop back and demonstrate this in HTTP for a second. Right. Because I've determined my own permission callback right here. And it's kind of like a fake thing because if I scroll down, I wanted to make it anonymous. So like check can post just returns true. So like there's not really any security here. And it's literally just, you know, if you if you post, you're good. Um, but again, that is scope to this endpoint, right? So like, there's only so much damage that somebody's gonna do if they do that. It's like, okay, create all the fake, you know, map point posts you want, it's not a big deal. Um, but that is to say that when we look at the rest of the WordPress uh, API, there is stuff that is unavailable to us if we're not logged in. And those things follow the same capability checks 
that happen in your traditional WordPress backend. Like, so posts obviously are a public thing. I want people to view my posts. So it only really makes sense that those things are available via the API. Um, but in WordPress, like previews or revisions, you need to be logged in to view those. So if I go here and I go to view this post, I can do that. But then if I drill down one layer beyond that into revisions, I get this, hey, sorry, you're not authorized to do this. So just because the API is out there doesn't mean that there aren't security protocols already in place based on what WordPress typically does. And there are a couple of ways, like if you wanted to authenticate with this, uh, you could, and there are a bunch of plugins. I think uh, Fran's working on a piece of content right now on how to do that um, in a couple of different ways with WP GraphQL, because again, that's the same. So if I go to my GraphQL endpoint, I'm not authenticated and I ask for revisions, it's going to give me a similar response. It's going to be like, hey, you're not, you know, I don't know who you are. You're not authorized to view this. Sorry about it. Um, so that is just kind of another thing to keep in mind as you're doing this style of development. And especially when you decide to like fully separate from WordPress, uh, because when we are like semi attached to WordPress or partially headless, like in this environment, um, I can actually pass data to my JavaScript app which I think I did in functions, let's see. I can localize my script, which basically, you know, will pass these pieces of data from my WordPress backend into the JavaScript context on this website. So like if I come down here and I want my, my front end website to use this REST nonce, which does some of the authentication stuff for you, I pass that in. If I'm a logged in user, it has my sort of credentials attached to it. And then I use that when I make my request. But if I start typing WP options, you can see in my JavaScript console, like that's available to the JavaScript code that's running on this page. So if I need to pass data back and forth and you're doing like a partially headless thing, um, that's a viable method where when, when you go fully headless or fully decoupled, you, you, there, you either need to use basic auth or like one of these other plugins like JSON Web Tokens or OAuth or something like that. Um, but cool. So that's the, the kind of last example I got. Um, I, I don't know. We got any other wrap up questions or Tom, you got anything you want us to circle back on? Do you think would be helpful for the audience? Well, I might ask you, Jeff, like, as you've progressed through this, you know, like you came when I first met you, you were pretty advanced in a lot of things, but like since then you've, you've gotten better at better. What's, what's your, uh, where do you go to listen to things? What do you, what do you, what do you consume that kind of drives you forward with all this stuff? Oh, that's a good question. So I'm not a huge podcast listener. Um, for me, it's really Twitter and being kind of plugged into the JavaScript community. And I certainly feel like if I had to like self-identify as some type of developer, which I don't really think I need to do, but I'm definitely much more comfortable doing stuff in JavaScript than I feel like I am in, in WordPress or like PHP or something else like that. So for me, that's one of the things that like Headless gives me is like, I, I've obviously got, you know, pushing a decade of experience doing stuff in the WordPress editor and like in the back end and building plugins and stuff. And so, um, you know, like it, it just, it, it makes it really freeing to build kind of what I want, how I want to build it, and then be kind of unopinionated about the back end and like not have to waste a bunch of time reinventing the wheel. Um, so definitely like if you're not on Twitter, <laughs> Hopefully you get on Twitter because that in and of itself is, is kind of a wealth of knowledge for people learning. And honestly, I am a pretty avid documentation reader and it's only fitting right now. Cause like I do, there's like part 25% of my job right now, or maybe, maybe around that is like literally writing documentation for other developers. So it's certainly come full circle, but that's what I do. It's like, anytime somebody's like, Oh, you know, WP GraphQL, what's that? Like, I'll go and I'll spend 30 or 45 minutes just browsing around the docs, like trying to get an understanding for what this thing does, how it does it. And so that even if I choose not to pursue it, like it's still somewhere in my brain, 
like, you know, it's, it's attached in some way. And like Fran and I talk about this a lot. Cause like when you're getting into development and like the deeper you kind of stare into that, well, like the deeper it goes, it doesn't ever get simpler or less new. And I think we were slacking about this. Like it doesn't get simpler or less nuanced. I think you just get better at ignoring what you don't need at that moment. And so like, that's what I try to do. I'm like, all right, let me get a cursory understanding of this and then like put a pin in it. And if I have time or inclination or a job focused reason to come back to it later, um, I will. And I'll also say, Tom, just, just to your credit, I mean, the time we spent together, like this was fa a fantastic exploration into like the beginnings of headless WordPress. So I think a lot of it comes from, you know, our time working at Alt Lab, like we had lots of creative freedom to determine how we wanted to build stuff like this. And nobody was saying, well, that doesn't sound like a good idea. It was more like, well, let's try it and see what happens. So I think having that attitude and some place that'll facilitate that for you is fantastic. So well, I got one more big picture question for you then. Okay. Um, so I, I imagine that there are a lot of people uh, trying to figure out, like, if I want to get more into programming, like, what language should I choose? Should I use libraries like Vue? You know, like what 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 are your thoughts on that? What what would you suggest if somebody came to you with that question? Oh yeah, well, yeah. So I guess like I read something the other day where it was like, basically, it was like somebody was talking about investment advice, and it was like, I don't want to know what you think. Tell me what's in your portfolio. Cause like, I think sometimes those are two different things where it's like, what do you think you should use? And like, what are you actually using to build the thing? And I've got to still say like, I'm, I'm, I'm hard view um, and JavaScript environment too. Like, yeah. And Fran posted in there, Fireship's a, a good, a good place to look uh, for, for inspiration and stuff. But uh, yeah, I continue to bet on JavaScript just because like, I like the web as a platform. And I think that it's just going to kind of get better and better. And quite frankly, like once you know JavaScript really well, you can use a lot of tools. Um, so you can do programming in the browser, things like Next.js or Nux or some of those JavaScript frameworks will also let you do server-side programming, like in a framework that's somewhat like WordPress in a way. Um, so I'm heavy bet on JavaScript. Um, and then my personal preference as a, like a library, if, if I was going to build more interactive stuff would be Vue. And I think for this audience, I might even be harder on that recommendation, right? Like React is definitely the most popular thing, but you got to look at who's using it and why they're using it and what they're building with it. And for me, I always liked Vue because it was really approachable, right? When we got started, at all lab back in like 2017, we were like, I could include a script, like here's a script tag and an HTML document. And then I could make this nice interactive thing. Like I didn't have to go through all these painful build processes and some of that stuff's gotten a little better, um, but some of it hasn't. And so for me, I feel like Vue is uh, a really approachable framework. And it's, and it's also geared towards the way that my mind works because I don't like care about the programmy nonsense like i want to make things and i don't want to have to think about like all this technical jargon or like organizational structure of my code really i want things to be clean and readable so that when i come back to it or somebody else looks at it um they can make sense of it and for me view does that but it's because it's kind of opinionated right it says if you have data that you want us to watch and react to this is where it goes here's where you put all of your methods that you're going to call from your little JavaScript component. You know, like, so if I want to call a function, there's a place for me to put that. Like there's lifecycle hooks and there's things like that, where the more I look at React, like it's, it just comes from a different place. Um, and for me, it just feels less approachable for a beginner. Um, but if anybody wants to fight me about it, I'll be outside. No. Uh, be outside. Yeah. How about that? But no, that's a great question. Well, um, I don't know. Do you have? Do you all have anything else you want to touch on, or should we wrap it up? I think I'm good, unless anybody's got specific questions. If you do, throw them in Discord. 
Um, and I'm happy to answer them after the fact too. Uh, the only other thing I would do is just sort of, you know, like plug, plug that developer's website. And so if you're interested in any of this stuff, um, you know, we've got a lot of resources out there. We've got some tutorials on view. And so we're really trying to be, you know, as welcoming as we can to like anything that anybody wants to use to do headless stuff. So there's a few tutorials, like I explored a, a newer framework, framework called Remix. Fran and I are going to meet up right after this, and we're going to talk about that Astro framework, which seems kind of cool. Um, and so, like, that's that's what I look for. And it's like goes back to what, what you always say, Tom, like, you know, looking for technologies that have a low barrier and high ceiling. Like, that's that's always, always good and important to do. And I think none of us has time, and unless you're, you want to be like a Google software engineer, you know, there's a large stuff, swath of stuff out there we can ignore and just make the cool things, like make the app that solves the problem for people. Um, Cause a lot of times that gets subsumed by like technical purity, I guess. Right. So I'm trying not to be that person for as long as I can. Right. It's like people get too excited about car engines and don't drive. Yeah. Cars. Yeah, exactly. And I'm just like, I just want to get from point A to point B and the speed limit is 55. So if it can go 80, I don't care. And as long as it gets me there. Um, but yeah, definitely check out, check out our websites. Uh, fo follow me on Twitter. Um, you know, just kind of however you want to get looped in. We are happy to help you. The other thing that I'll also plug uh, still on that same website. So we have a discord, um, that is really just focused on getting people up and running with headless WordPress. If you come to our website, click that link, you can hop in there. I think we're, uh, I don't know, maybe pushing seven, seven, 800 folks in there, uh, across a ton of different backgrounds and stuff like that. So working with a lot of different technologies. Uh, so if you're interested in even just lurking and sort of listening, and seeing what people are talking about, that's a great place to do it and a great place to like, if you have a question or want to reach out and don't want to do it on Twitter, you can you can find me in there um, answering questions pretty much every day. Well, and, and take note, I give Jeff my enthusiastic recommendation as, as somebody to talk to. He's always been amazingly open and kind. And for you, uh, more firmly rooted in academia, like he comes from a background of doing this with weird yes. faculty members towards weird goals. Yes. So. I have used what was the headless CMS. Oh my gosh. Like the book thing. Right. I built interactive JavaScript applications to, oh man, I can't even remember what that was called. Like bibliophile or something. I don't know. But yes, if you want to talk strange things in academia, I've done them. But Yep. Just thanks again to all, both y'all for having me. Like a super cool chat with everybody today. Great. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Yep.